Wow. So you see the son of uh, one of Hamas leaders is in a very close relationship with the, the Israeli general, my father. Um, and by the way, my father was number two officer in the West Bank during the first Intifada when his father uh, actually founded Hamas in the West Bank. So I can say my father was fighting his father, and I guess mm -hmm. one of them even imagine that their kids will meet and become uh, best friends, almost uh, brothers. Today's guest is Gonan Ben Itzak, Secret Service member, Israeli intelligence officer. He was entrusted with the task of recruiting and handling agents and preventing terrorist attacks. His life changed when he turned the son of one of the leaders of the Hamas terrorist organization, codename Green Prince, into becoming a double agent. He served for 10 years and is considered one of the top agents of all time. The documentary of how he pulled this off became a hit at Sundance, winning the Best Documentary Award in 2014. We go over what it's like to have to read people at such a dangerous level, what he learned in training that he applies to his everyday life, his thoughts on the Epstein case, the current geopolitical state of the world and the Middle East, and much more. Enjoy. The way of Will John. Welcome to the podcast, and uh, it's great to have you here. Thanks for being here, man. Great being here. Okay. So could you right. give us, as best you can, your background on to uh, why people are so interested in, in everything that you've done? Well, uh, <laughs> you know, I, uh, I grew up in a, a regular house. My father was a brigadier general in the Israeli army, but uh, I can say that... Uh, there wasn't uh, much influence. The fact that he was a uh, brigadier general in the Israeli army was not uh, affecting us much. So as a soldier, I served in the Israeli Navy. I wasn't, uh, let's say, the, the best uh, soldier uh, in the unit. Uh, but, you know, I, I served three years as people, youngsters in Israel, uh, are obligated to, to serve. I uh, finished my uh, service started to study psychology in Ben-Gurion University in Be'er Sheva, and actually graduated from Ben-Gurion University. But this happened in a very dramatic time in Israel because this was when Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated by an Israeli terrorist. And <clears throat> his assassination was shocking. Nobody predicted that you know, a Jew guy will come and assassinate uh, the Prime Minister of the uh, State of Israel. Um, I, I was really shocked. I wanted to do something meaningful. I wanted to do something that will affect uh, the future of the state of Israel. And then I decided something that at that time was not really realistic. I decided to join the Israeli Secret Service, which I knew nothing about. Yeah. You know, at that time, it was like super secret uh, organization. I never thought about going and working in the Israeli Secret Service. I had nothing to do with that. And I must say that my father, as Brigadier General, didn't like, for historical reasons, he didn't like uh, this organization. So when he first heard, of course, it was a secret, but when he first heard that I'm going to join uh, the organization, he asked me, why are you going to join this uh, dark organization? He was shocked. So in the end of 1996, I joined the Israeli Secret Service and I started to uh, work as a handler. Uh, in Ramallah area. Ramallah is uh, one of the biggest uh, Palestinian cities not far from uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and I was working in recruiting and stopping terror attacks. And at that time, I met a very special guy. His name is Musab Hassan Yosef. Musab, the son of uh, Sheikh Hassan Yosef. Sheikh Hassan Yosef one of uh, the most important leaders of Hamas in the West Bank, one of the founders of Hamas in the West Bank. And Musa, his older, oldest son, actually worked as a source for the Israeli uh, intelligence inside Hamas. So later on, I became one of his uh, handlers, and I became the manager of all Ramallah area during the Second Intifada, the Second Uprise of the Palestinians. Uh, again, a very dramatic time, many terror attacks. Uh, the time that Arafat was uh, sieged inside the Mukata, the headquarters of, of the Palestinians in Ramallah. I was in charge of uh, Ramallah. Uh, and later on, 
uh, the Green Prince, son of, this was the secret name of the son of uh, Sheikh uh, Hassan Yusuf, that worked for us. Later on, he managed to uh, escape, to go uh, to the United States. He asked for asylum in the United States. Uh, nobody helped him. So I felt the need to go and help him. And actually, I went to the United States to uh, testify on behalf of him against the will of the Shin Bet. Um, and this was a very good uh, story to make a documentary out of. <laughs> We also made a documentary, which uh, naturally uh, many people were, were interested in, in seeing this uh, movie that opened Sundance uh, Festival in 2014, won The Audience Award in Sundance won the Ophir Prize, which is kind of the Israeli Oscar uh, mm -hmm. in Israel. Um, yeah, it was a big story at that time. Totally. <clears throat> I mean, that's... Uh, I have tons of questions because there's so many different routes and things and places we could go. Uh, but I want to go... I'll, I'll go back to the kind of the, the, the bigger portion uh, And you said you're a handler. And so I'm curious for those of us that aren't within any sort of intelligence community or doing anything like that, what is the daily life? Like what's, what are, what are you worried about as a handler? What are your aims at as a handler? Like on a daily basis when you're in the field, you know, are you tense or what's the deal? So maybe I'll start with saying that human, the human intelligence that is based on people. Uh, we recruit people. Uh, those people work somewhere or do things that uh, we are interested in. Uh, and they give us a very uh, important intelligence about what's going on. So if we are talking about uh, the terrorist organization that is called Hamas, uh, at that time when we recruited the, the, the Green Prince, we didn't know much about Hamas. We didn't know who is recruiting the next uh, suicide bomber, uh, who are the members of Hamas. It was secret. So once I recruit someone inside the organization, I can get lots of information about who the people are, what are the plans, and so on. And in this way, I can first I can uh, stop terror attacks if if they plan terror attacks. I can get to some people if I want to arrest them, and sometimes I can also assassinate if I cannot arrest someone that is on his way to to do some terror attack. So recruiting uh, is very hard. You know, you understand that when you try to recruit someone that was raised in the Palestinian society, that naturally he was uh, always educated against the state of Israel. He knows nothing about Israel. He's very religious. Everything he knows about Israel is, is negative because, you know, a young guy, when, when does a young guy meet Israel? He meets them on a checkpoint, uh, maybe if he was arrested maybe in a big demonstration. And it's also always a very negative uh, experience. So now I need to get to this uh, guy and actually tell him, you know, go against the things you were educated, go against your family and friends, because, you know, once he starts to work with me, eventually he will need to give me uh, a sign to arrest his father, his uh, brother, maybe one of his uh, uh, best friends, maybe even... He will give me the sign that eventually will I will assassinate someone very closely, maybe even his father. So the betray here is, is huge. He's going to betray everything he believes in. And he also knows that uh, within the Palestinian Authority, there is only one crime that has no, uh, no solution. If you are caught as a traitor to the state of Israel, you are dead. Okay, so either they will kill you or either you'll need to go and do something, a like terror attack, and you'll die. So it's like a definite uh, death sentence. And now I need to come to him and tell him, you know, come and work for Israel. People think that the only way, way to do it, to recruit someone, is to give him money. Because, you know, we live in a world that money is like, uh, seem to be like the most important thing. But money is not uh, the answer. Usually what happens is we need to find people that they have some kind of, I will say, uh, psychological motive, something mm. that makes them uh, do it. Uh, it can be all kinds of uh, things, maybe someone that feels that nobody listens to him, 
and I will be the only one to listen to him. Maybe someone, um, let's say, in the Palestinian intelligence, but he, he feels that uh, he was not promoted. But within the Israeli intelligence, I promote him. I can give him uh, lots of uh, things. Um, and I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about mm. listen. People want, <laughs> many people, and you should know that because you have a very successful uh, podcast. People want to listen. Uh, people want that other people will listen to them. So once I listen to them, uh, they will open up and, and I'll have the chance sometimes uh, to recruit. Okay? Most Palestinians that I try to recruit, I, I cannot succeed because most people will not agree to something like this. And once I recruited someone, then you start working with him and there are lots of uh, challenges. Because first of all, you are working with someone that all the time can go to the other side and say, you know, I made a mistake, I'm working with Israel, which is very dangerous. And once he says that, maybe he will come and try to attack me because he wants to clean his, uh, his name. Um, you're talking with someone that um, uh, gives you intelligence, but it's not enough that he gives you intelligence. You always need to, to recheck and see if, they, if what he says is accurate or not. So you always need all, more uh, sources whether human uh, sources or SIGINT or whatever. Uh, so you always need to check yourself. And, you know, within the Israeli intelligence, where we say you never believe your source. It can be like 100% accurate for 10 years, but there is always a chance that uh, next day <clears throat> something will happen. You will make a mistake. He will be exposed. Uh, <clears throat> and it's a big uh, mistake. And also, once you recruit someone and you work with him, Let's say the Green Prince. The Green Prince uh, worked within Hamas. So basically, he's a terrorist. So how do you work with someone? Mm. He's a terrorist, but you don't want him to make terror attacks. So what happens if you take someone, now he's part of a terrorist uh, group. They uh, knock on his door in the middle of the night, tell him, okay, now we go to kill Israelis. What should he do? Mm. Because you cannot allow your source to go and kill Israelis. You walk in order right. to stop killing Israel. So many, many uh, big questions, ethical questions, if we can talk about ethics. In, in yeah. Which is, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> another. Yeah. yeah. Another That's question. something definitely worth, uh, is worth yeah. discussing. I mean, I've had on such interesting guys. It's funny because the ethics question hasn't really come up because, you know, as people on the outside, what's so incredible is just everything you just talked about is incredible. We don't have that daily that sort of daily, you know, I go to the store, I buy my my food, I go back, I don't, you know. And so that level of decision-making, of having to understand humans, we also, just the, the general public, I think, and I, it's leading to my next question, but, you know, there's always something to learn about the fellow humans, whether that's even empathy or uh, knowing danger or knowing that you shouldn't hire this person because clearly they have the signs of someone who wouldn't do something. You know, these are skills that you're honing a lot, you know, right? And and they they cost you. They could cost you your life. They could cost other people their lives. And so it's very important to you. Uh, and so um, I I want to go. I, I have two questions, but uh, this one should follow fairly fairly well. Um, were there ever times, or because you mentioned money, and everyone assuming that money is the greatest motivator, but also sometimes there is clearly different things, ego boosts. Like you said, you can give someone a title or listen to them, you know, uh, what about, because this is the one that's always now in the, I, I, at least I feel the darker side of blackmail of holding people, how efficient, because I, I, I had, um, Andrew Bustamante, who is a former CIA intelligence officer who mentioned that, uh, blackmail and things like that didn't, didn't work as well or that it was a bit too is, is that the same you have the same experience you guys have uh, what do you think by the way it's interesting because just a few years ago there was a big debate in israel some uh, ex-soldiers from the israeli military uh, intelligence claimed that israel is um, is collecting information intelligence about uh, let's say homosexuals in the, mm -hmm. the Palestinian society in order to blackmail them and recruit them well, 
I don't know uh, what's going on with the military intelligence in Israel, but I can tell you what, what's going on within the secret uh, service, which is um, something else. And I can tell you, we did not use blackmail as, as a, a mean of recruiting. Again, not because of ethics, okay? <laughs> not because of ethics, but because uh, we understood that once you, you blackmail someone, he will try to find a way to get out of this uh, situation. And usually, in our very um, violent uh, situation, it will lead to, uh, to a terror attack against you. So once you blackmail someone, probably one day he will come and try to uh, get even. And we don't want to make, again, we don't want to make terrorism. So this was the reason why we didn't blackmail. Now, of course, if we go again, to the philosophical uh, question, whether uh, the fact that you know that someone needs um, medical uh, care and somehow you use it in order to recruit him because in the future you give him the opportunity to go to Israel and get medical uh, uh, treatment, whether this is blackmail, yes or no? Okay, it's a big question. So I cannot say we didn't use sometimes let's say, the um, weaknesses of people in order to recruit them, okay? I, I need to be very uh, precise about mm -hmm. it, but not blackmail. Not, uh, we never uh, went to someone who said, okay, you are a homosexual. If you're not going to work with us, we'll tell everybody that you're, you're homosexual. This is something we never used. Wow. Um, yeah. And, and I mean, on the surface of things, that makes perfect sense to me uh, because it seems like with blackmail, while I'm sure it's been done before, I, I imagine it has been done, uh, it does seem a bit more, uh, I, I don't want to say dangerous, but random. Like when you put someone against a, up against a wall with the, you know, there have been cases where, where people have, uh, there was an unfortunate case in my uh, city, I believe it was, or maybe the city right next door where, where someone had found out about someone being homosexual and they killed themselves. And it wasn't someone trying to blackmail. It was just some people trying to, they were making fun. It was going to come out and he didn't want it to come out. And it's just this pressure. So it, it's a bit random. What can, what can happen on that? Um, I, 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 I want to move. And by by the way, I, I just want to emphasize that I said homosexual not because mm -hmm. they have anything against them. Sure, sure, sure. But, yeah, but yeah. because in the Palestinian society, this is a very sensitive issue. Okay. So totally. Yeah. For them, it's yeah, it's exactly, yeah. exactly. I know, I know, I know why you're you're referring to that yeah. in that specific yeah. case. Yeah. And, and it makes sense. Uh I, I'm I'm curious then uh the movie Munich. Have you seen that movie Munich? And I can't remember until I saw it a few times because that was very, it was very interesting. But I, I think it had to do with the Olympics. This is before my time, obviously. Yeah. Uh, and the terrorist attack uh, that happened. 1972. Okay. The methods that were employed after and all that stuff. Um, to what level is there any understanding of truth of the full story of what's going on? It's a fascinating story. Uh, and I don't know if you can just sum it up for the people who haven't heard it, but like, like, is this, it, uh, I have two questions. How true or how close is that? And how effective is that really? Uh, do, 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 you, do you guys feel, ah, we've solved it, you know, or, you know. Okay. So I'll, I'll say a few things about Munich. Uh, during the Olympics in, in Munich, in Germany, uh, a Palestinian tour uh, group entered the Olympic uh, village, uh, entered the Israeli uh, section, and uh, murdered, if I'm not mistaken, 11, uh, of, uh, 11 people from uh, the Israeli delegation. Uh, and afterwards, uh, Israel decided to go after all the people that were involved with this uh, terror attack and basically assassinate them. So during this uh, effort, of course, uh, the Israeli Mossad made a mistake uh, in Sweden, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Uh, they actually assassinated someone by mistake that was not uh, related. But some of them were assassinated. Some of them were assassinated in Lebanon, in, in Beirut. Uh, a special commando force went to Beirut 
uh, and assassinated some of them in Beirut. And, and uh, it was, uh, first of all, a decision uh, to let them know that Israel will hunt them no matter where they hide, even if it's in the middle of uh, Lebanon. Uh, and it was, you know, taking revenge. How effective it was, and, and this leads us to the question, how effective are the uh, assassinations? I saw many assassinations, especially during the Second Intifada. And sometimes, you know, I, I say, you know, one week we assassinated the head of uh, Hamas, let's say in Ramallah. Another week, or the week later, uh, we assassinated the head of Hamas in Ramallah. And the week later, we assassinated the head of Hamas in Ramallah because assassinations cannot kill ideology. They cannot kill uh, an idea. Okay, they can uh, kill people. So sometimes, yeah, you need to use assassinations. Sometimes you use assassination in order to stop someone that you have no other mean in order to stop him. And in order to stop the terror attack, you do it. Sometimes... Uh, assassinations can be very effective. I remember the assassination of Fatih Shkaki, that was the head of the Islamic Jihad. Uh, he was assassinated in Malta. And after his assassination, for many years, the Islamic Jihad was very weak. And, and later on, okay, they, they found some new leader. And I remember the assassination of, um, what was his name? Uh, Musawi, Abbas Musawi. Uh, leader of Hezbollah in Lebanon. Mm. Later uh, on, after his assassination, Nasrallah became the head of uh, Hezbollah. And I don't remember that Nasrallah was much better than uh, Musawi. Mm. So Nasrallah, uh, even today, makes uh, lots of headache to the state of Israel. So assassination is something that sometimes uh, state, uh, states uh, use. Many, many times it's not very effective. Um, unless you say, you know, revenge is part of our life and we want you know, to feel that we, we get even. But I think that uh, this is not a very, revenge is not a very good uh, guide for uh, diplomatics, for, uh, for leading a state. So, um, you know, sometimes uh, you need it, but basically it's not a very good uh, mean right. of, yeah. And 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 that is uh, the way the way you put it. It's it, it's not a good way to lead a state, which is actually really interesting because uh, there should be a goal, right? The assassination is used to do something, and like you said, if it's not going to kill the ideology, just like getting to the source of any problem, you have to you got to get to the source. You can't just stop chopping off or putting band aids on it. It's just going to keep going, and uh, so it it's such a tricky situation. And uh, go ahead. Did you want to say something? It's a very tricky situation, and I'll tell you something. And after many years, uh, you know, I worked for the Israeli Secret Service. I served the Israeli army. My father, for many years, served the Israeli army. My son is going to uh, join the Israeli army this uh, Thursday. Um, You know, for 50 years, um, we control, today is about, two, maybe two and a half, three million uh, Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. Um, We try to tell ourselves that we are a democracy because, you know, in Israel, every few years we have uh, elections. Last few years we have like five or six elections, which uh, is too much. Uh, We have elections, we have parties, people go and uh, vote. Basically, we have freedom of speech. Basically, we have the freedom uh, to demonstrate, uh, but three million people don't have. <laughs> and three million mm-hmm. people are under uh, a military uh, control. And I ask myself, how can we be a democracy if at least three million people in this <laughs> equation are not taking part of, of this uh, game? And this is the main problem because, you know, you can assassinate as much as you want. I think that in the West Bank, Israel, the Israeli uh, intelligence is very strong. Uh, usually they, they are very successful in stopping terror attacks. If not talking about the Second Intifada, you know, we, we finished the Second Intifada in 2000, uh, 
to start 2001, uh, ended 2004, uh, with over 1,400 1, Israelis that were murdered during the second uprising, the second intifada. So I asked myself, as a father, as mm-hmm. a father, not as an ex Shin Bet, not uh, as, a, as a citizen in the state of Israel and someone that uh, saw few things, <laughs> even yeah. you know, in the more, uh, we say, uh, uh, hidden uh, parts of, of the history. I asked myself, mm-hmm. what is our end game? Where do we want to, to take it to? Uh, what kind of uh, future we give our children? You know, because yeah, we can fight. Israel is strong. Israel has a very strong army. Uh, I don't know in uh, in the world. I, I don't know about it, but uh, people say that Israel has the nuclear power. I don't know if we do or not, mm-hmm. but this is what people say. Um, we are very strong. So sometimes being strong uh, is not a very good thing, you know? <laughs> and it doesn't lead us to a very uh, good uh, uh, future. And I really don't see right now where our leadership is taking us to. Um, um, And I don't, by the way, I don't see where the Palestinian leadership is taking the Palestinians to, but this is their leadership. I'm talking about my leadership because I I, I don't need to uh, criticize others while I do need to criticize my my leadership uh, and they take us to hell. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'm so, I want to touch on two things that you said, because uh, it's funny, you, you asked the question, rightfully so, right, in a proper democracy, three million people, if they're concerned, and I mean, Israel's not a massive, it's not a massive place by comparison to some countries, right? Three million people, I think there's less, that's not even my state in, is Kansas, you know, and we get made fun of for being, for having no people in the country, yeah. right? And that's, it's, it's big. Yeah. And, uh, I, I I even want to push further because it's funny. In we also in the U.S. to a certain extent, and the 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 mentality is a bit changing. Um, however, there's you know you know how proud Americans are of free speech, democracy. This is this is the thing, and ever so slightly, some people are starting to notice that potentially you're a part of it, but you're not really making any of the decisions at all. It's like it's kind of limited to some people. We'll tell you that you get some, you get to talk about it. We'll tell you that you get to do this, and we're gonna say it's a democracy. But the same people are kind of making the decisions, and you probably won't be in a position to do so. It's not truly like this ancient Greek democracy where we're just gonna call up some people and we're gonna change it out, and that's not happening. And, and so, in the same sense, yeah, you you have to ask yourself, well, what what would happen if we, if the open lines of communication could actually happen. But at the same time, it doesn't really matter if they've decided end game is revenge. And so if end game is revenge, or if they haven't decided on an end game, they just decided on the next best move, which is just fight back. If they do, if they hit me, we hit them and the and then there's no need to communicate because there's no goal for anyone and and there's never going to be anything solved. And, and so I, I I would love to, and I threw this country question, I'm not sure who I did to last time, uh, but if you could Project into the future, and I know it's just highly speculative. Will there be any change? If there is, is there a moment of change? Do you see any change in the near future, or do you see anything that could possibly happen over the course of 50, 100 years that could turn this situation? In the uh, close of the future, there will be uh, some dra- dramatic change because uh, the time of Abu Mazen, the leader of the Palestinians, will come to an end. You know, he's, he's not a young uh, guy. Mm. He's not uh, very healthy. And I guess that uh, soon, soon can be five years, 10 years. Uh, of course, I, I hope he will live forever, but mm-hmm. um, one day he will die. Nobody knows who will be his successor. And in the Palestinian Authority and among Palestinians in general, uh, everybody understands that this will be a moment of, of change within the Palestinian Authority because uh, many, uh, pe- many people will come and try to get uh, their share. Uh, it might uh, bring lots of uh, violence uh, within the West Bank. Um, so I, I don't 
uh, expect the next few years to be very stable. Um, in the long run, um, it's very hard to say because, you know, I see what's going on in Israel. Demographically, for example, Israel is becoming more and more religious. Um, liberals today are, uh, are becoming uh, less and less uh, powerful. Uh, we saw, you know, the outcome of uh, the last uh, elections. Uh, Netanyahu and his new government is going to be a very, very conservative uh, government. They're, they want to change Uh, maybe um, uh, the legal system, uh, they want to change uh, the status quo between, uh, not, uh, between secular Jews and uh, very orthodox, uh, orthodox uh, Jews. They might change uh, the status of uh, the homosexuals in Israel, that basically, you know, homosexuals in, in Israel, mm. uh, they have uh, freedom and they could do whatever right. they want. But this government, is talking more and more about changing this uh, situation. So it, for now, it seems that Israel is going to a very uh, uh, bad path. The leader of Israel right now, uh, the chosen uh, prime minister, is a corrupted guy, is a super corrupted guy. Um, and of course, in order to get away with this uh, corruption, because now, you know, he's, he's going to court every few days and... Uh, he he might be sent uh, to prison. Uh, he is uh, willing to do whatever needed in order to uh, escape from it and maybe even change uh, the democratic system in Israel, which is the biggest uh, fear right now among uh, liberals in, in Israel. So we have a very negative uh, process right now in Israel. But, you know, these, uh, these uh, things can change. I remember how... Uh, Rabin uh, uh, government announced that they speak with Palestinians, which was like, you know, it seems like uh, mm -hmm. science fiction. And actually they brought uh, Arafat and they signed the Oslo agreements and uh, most Israelis were very happy about it. Yes, yeah, there was, of course, opposition. Some people were opposing. He got a mirror that this Israeli uh, terrorist, Jew terrorist uh, assassinated uh, Rabin because of that. Uh, but at that time, uh, things were very positive. So I think the change can happen, and it's only a, a matter of uh, leadership. Once you have a leader like Sadat in, in Egypt, that a few years after the uh, 73 war came to the Israeli parliament, which was, you know, for him as the most powerful uh, leader in, in, in the Arab world, was humiliation to go to the Israeli parliament. He came to the Israeli parliament and he signed a peace agreement, historical peace agreement between Egypt and, and Israel. And since then, we have no war. Nobody gets wow. killed right. on the Israeli-Egyptian uh, border. Uh, let's talk about uh, King Hussein that signed the peace agreement between Jordan and Israel. Okay. For many years, King Hussein was uh, uh, in a very good uh, relationship with the Israeli leader, leaders, but he felt that he can now sign a peace agreement, and there is peace in Jordan. You know, I'm, uh, today, I'm, I'm not today, but I'm saying the last uh, few uh, months, I visited uh, Jordan several times. Yeah, I go there. Right. Yeah. I enjoy Amman, which is a wonderful uh, city, and I say, wow. You know, a piece of normality. We can go to Amman. <laughs> Once was, you know, uh, they It's were forbidden. our enemies. And I can go eat falafel in, in Amman and, and everything is okay. Everything yeah. is okay. So this is a matter of leadership. The Somehow the Western world lacks leaders. You know, <laughs> we see what's going on in the United States. Um, we see what's going on in, in uh, Europe. Uh, some of uh, the new leaders are, um, let's say, uh, um, are less uh, interested in democracy and less interested in, mm -hmm. in uh, doing sure. the right thing, uh, which is a big problem. But I believe if you ask about our region, it's only a matter of time that we will have a leader that, or leaders that will lead uh, this area to, to a better uh, future because there is 
no, no other solution. There is no other solution. You know, it's, yeah. it's crazy. <laughs> we kill our, our kids from both sides. We kill our uh, kids for nothing. You know, right. once, it's terrible to say. It's really terrible mm-hmm. to say. But once I, I went somewhere in Israel and I saw um, like a piece of, of uh, rock, you know, stating that uh, here someone was killed or this is in a me- memorial uh, place. This is in memory of this guy that was killed in this uh, terror attack. And I asked myself, for what? For what? Like, and then what? Nothing happened. Nothing. Nothing. Yes, I know. I know. I know. I know. And and these are the extreme cases, you know. And it's it would be so nice if people also took those ideas. And this is I'm not comparing these by any means. Obviously, the death of someone and like this, but it starts with small things too in our lives where we just start and pick up the phone and we read this and we do this and we do mindless. And that it, that bleeds over to bigger decisions on where to go and what to do with your life, and then this leads to well, yeah, maybe I should you know kill myself for this cause because it will it, it won't do what you think that it will do, and you haven't got, given it the thought of what is really the best thing. I want to continue to a certain extent down that down that road, and maybe we'll touch on it before we before we finish. But I don't want to miss out on asking you on a really interesting thing that's captured the entire world over the last I don't know how many years. It's been probably two, three. It's hard it's hard to tell. With these things, and I don't know if you can comment on it or even this because you have a very unique situation. But the Epstein case, the Ghislaine Maxwell case, and everyone is convinced that they know what happened, that he didn't uh, commit suicide, that this happened. There's supposed links to to Israel in with all that. Uh, just as your take, and you can obviously go as deep as you as you want to, but as your take for someone who's worked in the intelligence community, does this have the linkings and trappings of someone mixed up in something like this? Does this smell like that to you? Do you go, oh, clearly, if it's not even Israel, maybe it's, uh, who knows, whatever, France or God knows where, you know? Do you have that? Or like, what's your take on it? Because I mean, you must have a unique thought on the whole thing. So, of course, I'm not, uh, I don't know all the details about uh, this uh, um, Maxwell uh, Epstein, sorry, uh, situation. Mm-hmm. Um I can, first of all, I, I must say um, personally that I'm disgusted with the, the way he uh, decided to, uh, to live his life. I think it's really disgusting. Um, I'm disgusted by people that uh, knew uh, about uh, his behavior and, and didn't speak out, which is ugly. I know that somewhere on the way, there was an Israeli uh, cyber company, uh, if I'm not mi- mistaken, Black Cube. I hope I'm not mm-hmm. mistaken. Uh, that was involved uh, with his effort. Uh, no, th- sorry, this was something else. I think Black Cube uh, were um, involved with the case of uh, Weinstein, the um, the producer. Ah, okay, yes, yes, uh, yeah. I'm mixing. Sorry, I'm mixing. Okay, but anyway, sure. anyway. Uh, First of all, in his position, uh, going from being, you know, a billionaire and uh, knowing everybody uh, all around the world and everybody who were uh, kissing his uh, butt uh, to uh, being uh, in the prison, of course, this is shocking to the extent that some people can commit suicide. Um, I do know that he was involved in so many things and you knew so many uh, people that were involved with his uh, misbehavior that some people had, you know, the motivation right. to make him uh, shut up. And it's very yeah. hard to say. It's very hard to say. Um, I saw during the uh, years, uh, sometimes uh, things we see on movies, uh, reality can be more crazy than, than the movies. You know, I, I remember seeing House of Cards and yeah, I've you, seen it. Yeah, House of Cards, you, you see this uh, TV series to say, okay, this is crazy. Uh, it, it can't happen. It, it can't be, you know, they, they went very far. And then Trump, you know, <laughs> and you see what happened with Trump. And then Trump, and say, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah the writers. Same, similar playbook, yeah. Yeah, they could have uh, done better, you know, right. look at the Trump. <laughs> yeah, so, 
uh, it's very hard to say. And again, I, I don't want to uh, say anything because I don't have uh, the information. Sure. Uh, um, his absence from our life uh, is not a big uh, loss. Mm. It's not right. a big loss. Um, but, you know, someone like him, you don't watch uh, the cameras. You don't know what's going on. Uh, yeah. so, I, very strange. It's, it's weird. Yes, I know. Yeah, that's very all. Strange, you know? <laughs> yeah. But, but mm. don't forget, when I uh, see the, um, uh, you know, that uh, Rabin assassination was actually filmed. There was someone standing and, and uh, taking uh, pictures of or uh, filming okay. the area. And by mistake, he filmed the assassination. Of who, though, did you say? Of Yitzhak Rabin, our prime minister. Ah, of the prime, of the prime minister. Oh, wow, someone, on accident. So, yeah, yeah, on accident. And when you see it, you, you, you say, like, what? The, the Israeli Secret Service can't uh, protect the Israeli prime minister? And sometimes, you know, sometimes stupid things happen, and it's very hard even to explain so you go and try to find maybe conspiracy or something. Sometimes we're just dumb, you know? We're yeah. dumb and we don't do the right thing. That's it. Yeah. As, as dumb as it can be, it happens. It's so, uh, it's so interesting. I'm reading a few books right now on clear thinking and <clears throat> decision-making, and they always refer to Occam's razor from the guy William Occam, I think of like the 1400s or something, which is the simplest explanation is usually, or at least should be your starting point for explaining, you know, a situation. It's not always the case. It's more than likely the case, but it's a good starting point rather than conjuring up all this stuff. It's easier yeah. to think that when, you know, uh, I think also uh, there's a, I, I was living in Sweden during the uh, pandemic and I didn't know of the Olaf Palme, uh, right. who was the prime minister and that, and, you know, he was killed and that was a big shock to them, right. obviously, but there right. was, you know, there's a plenty of conspiracy theories and what was going on and who did this and, and they're also the simple explanation that the guy told his security, his team to go home that night. Yeah. And yeah. someone just saw the opportunity and they shot him. And yeah. it could be as simple as that. You know, I don't know. Uh, but uh, all, all, all this types of thinking, and I, I don't know if I, maybe we mentioned this on before when we were recording before or off, uh, off air, but the type of education that you got while in there to learn these uh, traits to do this stuff. Did they teach you anything? Did you do a lot of learning on the job? Uh, and can you take any of this now? Do you ever just go to, I don't know, McDonald's and just be like, ah, you're not going to give me a cheeseburger. <laughs> <laughs> you're just like, yeah, you know things. <laughs> well, training was uh, very long because in the beginning, I needed to uh, study Arabic. I didn't speak Arabic. I didn't know even a word okay. in Arabic. So for almost eight or nine months, I just studied Arabic. And later on, I had a very long uh, training to become a handler. Uh, I learned many things, but uh, I must say, and I think I told you in our last uh, conversation, I felt that there are two personalities. I have two personalities. One is the everyday personality, um, which... I don't think that I bring the handler into my everyday life. Mm -hmm. um, and there was the handler, which I saw maybe for the first time after I left the Shin Bet, I, I saw it first time on Sundance when I watched the, 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 the documentary. This was the first time that I remembered who I was as a handler because I feel that I put this uh, personality uh, behind when I left uh, the Shin Bet or maybe when I was discharged from, from the shin bed. Um, and uh, some people don't know how to, to do it. I, I didn't decide to do it. It just happened. So today, you know, uh, everyday life, I, I don't think that I'm very, uh, that I use uh, manipulation. I don't think that mm. uh, I use the skills I had in the shin bed. Sometimes I even want to do it, but I don't have it anymore. Mm. Um, so I really feel like two different personalities, one that I used when I was a handler and one that I use uh, today. Uh, but it's very hard to divide. And sometimes I, I saw people, you know, that they lie to their sources, they lie to their uh, managers, they lie mm. to their wives, friends, kids, 
Um, and I, I think I'm very, I'm very lucky that I left the other personality in the Shin Bet and I didn't take it back home. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that compartmentalization, I think, is what you're describing, which is probably a huge... And I think in my discussion with some of the other guys, they talked about that as being something that was needed to be taught uh, because of this situation, like you're like you're talking about. You can't just go from having to be in these high-stakes situations to treating the rest of the world as if it's like this. Uh, it, it, it probably would get in the way. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, these days I'm working on a new doc- documentary okay. um, that actually somehow deals with that because in, in my story, the story is about uh, a Lebanese source for the Israeli uh, military intelligence that uh, came to meet his handler in 1988 and disappeared. And I'm trying to uh, find out what what happened to him. Um, and I came to this story because I, 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 I wanted to understand how come a handler meets his source and the source vanishes. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, the, the very uh, uh, complex uh, relationship between a handler and a source, sources, of course, you use them. Okay, you use them. But at the same time, they are like your kids. The, the um, relationship between a handler and, uh, and a source is like a father and son. So... Basically, when when you meet your source and it disappears, uh, it's like you did something to your to your son. Um, so now I'm trying to to find out this the documentary to find out what what happened to this uh, source and what happened to his handler that made him do maybe something to his source. Um, and this is you see this is the um, people I'll say all sources they have some. I'll say some psychological, uh, e- not issues. I, I'm not trying to say issues, but some psychological reason why they became sources. And I think all intelligence uh, handlers, workers, whatever, they also have some psychological reason why they came to this point, why they became handlers. Right, and, and sometimes it's very close to uh, the reason why the sources became sources. Yeah, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. cool. uh, you, you, it's perfect because uh, your 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 documentary leads on to something that I also am truly curious about. If you can talk about it, but what within what you did was the most dangerous? Do you have a moment or a few moments where you thought, "Oh shit, if this goes south." You know, or were you able to steer clear? And and how closely did you have? Did you have friends? And did were you able to tell everybody your family, everybody know what you were doing, or or no? When I walked in the shindet, my wife, of course, knew because uh, she needed to to do uh, uh, the uh, you know uh, the clearance uh, security mm-hmm. clearance for the shindet. So of course she knew. My close family knew that I'm walking in the shindet, and of course they didn't know what I'm doing, but they knew that I'm in yeah. the shindet. Um, other people, we were told to say that we're working for uh, some uh, military, uh, not military, for, for some uh, governmental uh, office. And they mm-hmm. gave us, like, I'll say, a code for the governmental uh, office. But, you know, in Israel, we don't have many secrets. So I remember one time we were sitting with friends and they asked me, where do you work? And I said, no, oh, no, I'm working in this uh, <laughs> governmental office. And said, okay, Shin Bet, like secret service. <laughs> Why don't you say Secret Service? Yeah. Why didn't you tell <laughs> stories? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they knew. They knew yeah. that I'm working in, in uh, the ship. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah, because uh, I, I find that also just the, the toughest thing, I'm sure, for people that are trying to do this. And undercover guys having to say, I, I work here when, you know, and I, I, I've met over the course of, you know, while playing and, and playing different places, you meet, we meet ambassadors and, uh, all these different people. And uh, one of the ambassadors told me, said, you know, everybody you're meeting, all these people, he said, you've met probably quite a few intelligence officers and spies. And I said, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, he's the ambassador to this person and he's that person. He's like, that's not, he's like, that's not what they're doing. These young guys, all these young, you know, guys that I'm meeting in their 20s, 30s, 40s, you know, and he's like, that's not what they're doing. And I said, so what? He, he said, well, uh, many times he said the the states they will use 
these offices as cover for them. And uh, of course, because it's like, you can't just sign up and say, I'm a spy or whatever. So, but you know, of course, uh, the Israeli secret service, um, the work is less covert. Of course, you work mm. with sources. Nobody knows about them. So this, of course, covert. But uh, for me, as uh, when I went to uh, Ramallah, for example, I told people I'm, I gave my secret uh, name. I had the secret name in the Shin Bet. My name was Captain Luai. So I said, I'm mm-hmm. Captain Luai. But they knew that I'm part of the secret service. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and it was known to everybody. Wow. Uh, so... I mean, with with all that being said, is there is there anything you would have uh, you would have changed in the sense that like you 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 had this? It's taken up a big part of your your life. I mean, it's a pretty defining portion. Was there ever a chance that you could have gone in a different direction? And if you did, what would you what could you imagine your life going without this? <laughs> um... You know that uh, first of all, it, it wasn't very easy. We saw I saw. Many uh, hard uh, things during the Second Intifada, terrible, mm-hmm. terrible attacks and, and stuff. But I remember the night that uh, the Green Prince, the documentary, uh, played in uh, Sundance. They opened uh, the festival. And afterwards, HBO made like uh, an event for us after the movie. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember that uh, Robert De Niro came <laughs> okay. again. And I started to laugh and I told Mossab, the Green Prince, I told him, you know, we came, both of us, like two uh, <laughs> troublemakers from uh, Ramallah. <laughs> and we sit now in, in Sundance in an <laughs> event with Robert De Niro. Like, what are the odds? <laughs> so I think that, you know, uh, the way I went, uh, especially with the, with the Musa, with the Green Prince, um, was so unique. Uh, and the relationship between us is so strong because really today is mm. a brother and is part of our family. We spent uh, last week, uh, last two months, we spent with him abroad. And uh, mm. for my kids, is is an uncle, you know, Uncle Musa. Right. Uh, although he's Palestinian, and his relationship with my father is very strong. As you know, with his father, there is no. Uh, relationship because his father disowned him publicly. Wow. So you see the son of uh, one of Hamas leaders is in a very close relationship with the, the Israeli general, my father. Mm-hmm. Um, and by the way, my father was number two officer in the West Bank during the first Intifada when his father uh, actually founded Hamas in the West Bank. So I can say my father was fighting his father, and I guess mm-hmm. none of them even imagined that their kids will meet and become uh, best friends, almost uh, brothers. Um, you know, this is something I would never give up. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's worth. I mean, yeah. In the same sense, it's like when people ask me uh, life without football, right? And the directions that it's taken me, and all the stuff. It's just you can't really fathom it. Uh, so uh, in 2020, and I'm just reading off of a couple other notes. In 2020, you were listed on the markers list of 100 most influential people. Are, are you aware? You're aware of this, I'm assuming. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, when when someone names you, I mean, it's a that's a pretty serious thing uh, to a certain extent. Um, what what does that when you see that? Probably you just see it and it's like, okay, that's nice. Thank you. I understand what I did. I know why I'm here. Yada yada. But if you sit back and, and move, move back and, you know, you've got the De Niro thing and all this and being an influential person as far removed from when you did all of this, right? In 2020, what does that, what, how does that make you feel in the sense of what do you think that the, the Israeli people and just the, you know, the media in general think of you as a person and, and it's clearly still very important to them? Uh, you know, I pay, I pay uh, personal prices for that because right now, I have uh, criminal charges against me because uh, during the 2020 uh, demonstrations against Netanyahu, one of the I was one of a few uh, lawyers. I'm also a lawyer, so I was mm-hmm. one of few lawyers uh, that were representing uh, demonstrators that you know had uh, some uh, issues with the, the police. And in one of the demonstrations, in all of the demonstrations, they 
use the, the, the police used water cannon against uh, demonstrators, uh, against demonstration. Uh, we felt that the Israeli police is actually working for Netanyahu. And by the way, I still think it. Um, mm-hmm. The Israeli uh, police is very biased. And uh, I needed to uh, do something, so I went underneath one of the water cannons uh, in order to stop them using it against uh, uh, the the people. Um, I claim today, I claim then, I claim today, the way they use it is against their own uh, regulations. It's not, I'm not going to tell the police when to use water cannon. I'm just saying use it according to your uh, regulations, which they didn't. So I'm ra- right now I'm, I'm, I need to deal with the uh, criminal charges. You know, mm-hmm. I can lose my, my, uh, uh, my license to work as a lawyer and I, I can pay. So I paid high prices for that. And again, I, I started by saying that when Rabin was assassinated, I really t- wanted to do something meaningful to my, uh, my, my country, to my people. I, now we, my wife and I, we have four kids and, you know, I'm 52 years old. I did my, whatever I can do, I did. I went to the <laughs> army. I went to the Israeli secret service. I stopped many terror attacks. Um, I went to demonstrations. The only thing I want today, I don't want more money. I want nothing. I want right. my kids to have good future. That's it. <laughs> and I'm willing to fight for it. And I guess this is why people, you know, some people uh, respect it. Uh, mm. By the way, some other people don't respect it. <laughs> yeah, and it's okay. It's okay. In democracy, yeah. it's okay. Uh, sure. I don't expect everybody to think the same. Um, and, uh, you know, this is my goal. My goal is to make. Uh, Israel a better place for my kids mm-hmm. and my cats and my cats <laughs> in your cats is that what you said <laughs> ah, yeah I the, that would that'll take us way way off so I I uh, so I've never had I had guinea pigs when I was a kid <laughs> but I've never had uh, and I love animals just in general I, I I love cats I love dogs I I want a bunch I just keep it's one of those things it's very similar to so I speak Italian. And I learned I learned Italian without going to Italy. Uh, yeah. I've only spent seven days in Italy fully. Wow. I think maybe eight. Wow. Uh, and so it's always fun when I get a chance to go there and speak right. Italian because people always say, "Oh, well, how long have you been in the country?" I'm like, "This is my right. sixth day." It's, <laughs> it's always fun. But uh, the reason that I, I I say this is because I procrastinated. I played in Croatia over ten years ago. Uh, mm-hmm. In Croatia borders Italy, and I kept saying. I would go. I kept saying, I'll, I'll go. When the, and then when the pause and the break of the season happened, I would just go home to the U.S. I would never do it. You know? And so you, 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 bring up, you bring up the cats, and it's reminding me of this fact that I've been saying for years that I'll get a cat, and then I'll get a couple of dogs. I still haven't done it. And uh, I, don't, I, I have no idea what the, you know, what the <laughs> switch and where the real switch is going to be. Uh, but before we, before we finish, as a, our a last thing, I said I would come back to it. And because you spoke about what the police, what the Israeli police are doing, and because we touched on it earlier, which is ethics within the intelligence agencies, not just of Israel, but of the entire world in trying to get their goals or their stated goals and their mission accomplished, where it seems that essentially on the surface level, we'll say that we have ethics and morals to a certain degree, and right, that's the state's job. But in the back end, it's basically you got to do whatever is going to get the mission solved to a, a certain degree as long, or it seems like at least to me on the outside, you'll tell me if it's not as long as if you need to do something that is questionable, make sure you don't get caught. Uh, make sure it doesn't, it doesn't come back to the state or if it does, we can't have an official, you know, uh, saying that this was us trying to do X. We won't, we will disown this. We will stand back from this. If it works out well and nothing happens smooth, maybe we take credit. I don't know. But what is your, was your final thought on, on all that? When I uh, tried to join the, the Shin Bet, I was asked because that time I was a part of, uh, I was a member in, in uh, Meretz uh, party. Meretz, Meretz is a left-wing uh, party. 
And I was asked in the Shin Bet if it's not going to interfere with what I'm going to do because you know, I'm going uh, to work in the Shin Bet. And I said, I, I bring myself to what I do. Okay, I decide how I do things. And even if I do harsh things, you know, fighting uh, terrorism, there is a way to do it. Okay, there is a way to do it. You don't have to uh, be cruel to others if uh, you uh, go and arrest someone. When you go and arrest a terrorist, you don't need to be uh, to behave uh, in a negative way to his uh, children. And you know it's very hard when you go into a house, you see the the children, the babies, you know the special unit is entering the home. You see their eyes wide open. They don't even understand what's going on. It's very hard. And you know their father is going to blow up a, a bus. But they don't have any blame for that. So you can be very harsh with their father to arrest him. Mm. And you can still uh, behave uh, in a decent way as a human being to his family. And this, I think this is what I brought with me. So I'm saying, no, there is no ethics when you talk about intelligence. Okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, we cannot pretend. No ethics. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And still, you can stay a human being when you deal even with your enemy. And I think this is also why my relationship with uh, Musab, with the Green Prince, was very strong because he always knew that, yes, he's a source. I use him, okay? As Israel or as his ender, I use him. But he always knew that I I, I looked him in in the eyes and I treat him as a human being, Mm. not as a traitor, not as Palestinian, not as I don't know what. I, I see in front of me a human being, and he's so human being. And I think this was why we were very successful at that time in, in doing things, uh, very uh, big operations. We uh, were uh, successful in stopping uh, big uh, terror attacks because he knew that I treat him and others, of course, that I treat them as human beings. And this is, you know, this is what I can bring with me. This, this was my way. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's perfect. It's a perfect thing to close on because just it, it seems to be the same thing with me. Traveling all around the world, people saying you have to be a little careful about this people or this culture or this. And honestly, I've not seen that. If you treat people with respect, it there's just yeah. it just seems to work. It just yeah. seems. And I, I've been all over the world. And as long as you you do your thing, it the people trouble does follow the people that seem to cause trouble. They don't see <clears throat> it as that. They might see them as these people and that people that, but it doesn't seem to be the case. So, yeah. uh, perfect. I, I want to thank you tremendously for, yeah. for coming on. I don't know that yeah, you have social you. media or any place we can send everybody. We'll, we'll link to obviously the, the film. Uh, and if there's anything else that you want us to link to or, or send people to, you just let us know or. Lilach can uh, send it to me and then I can, you know, I can. I, I yeah. Can... Okay. Well, yeah. So, all right, guys, we'll link to everything there in the show notes. And yeah, thanks once again. Really appreciate it. My pleasure, really. Thank okay. you so much.